Hey, it's Mike here, and today, the dark art of blunting negative health effects from meals that are loaded with processed foods. Is this gonna help your overall health or hurt it? We'll see. This is why I joke that it's a dark art, because it's not really an ideal health situation to be eating these processed foods in the first place. You're gonna be better off without them. But, you know, there's situations where you end up eating processed foods, you wanna try new restaurants, etc. So is there something you can do there? We're gonna look at a ton of research on this. But yeah, let's get right into it. How did I end up coming up with this topic? Well, as somebody who travels and ends up trying new vegan restaurants for whatever reason or is at events and it's like, oh my God, this is really not healthy. I wonder if there's some little thing that I can do, a hack, if you will, here and there to prevent what could otherwise be, you know, maybe massive blood sugar or blood fat spikes, which we'll get into. But, you know, after that meal, you just feel like a brick. And so that has happened to me. And over the years, I have employed some of these techniques, but through more research, I've definitely found a another set of them. I wanna try some of these new ones that I've researched. But my one disclaimer is, please don't use this as an excuse to just eat a bunch of processed foods and then try and ameliorate the situation later. That's not the intention of this video. And I, I will say you will not be better off. And yeah, after eating these processed food meals, it is the case that not so great things happen in your body uh, from this study. Using a meal of glucose and whipped cream, you know, very similar to a milkshake per se, they then measured the blood responses and this chart says it all. You get a pretty fat blood sugar spike, which then turns into a sort of blood fat spike over time, causing not just a lowering in artery function via flow-mediated dilation, that FMD, but also an increase in inflammation in terms of C-reactive protein. And of course, one of the negative effects we're trying to dodge there is the oxidative stress and downstream inflammation and aging that can come from those high levels. So first, let's get into what you can do to blunt some blood sugar spikes, and I will say, there's a ton of fear going around raising blood sugar at all, especially on the internet and TikTok and these people, these blood glucose monitors. But no, you know, healthy people, their blood sugar is gonna raise to a healthy amount and there's no indication that that's doing like oxidative damage to some crazy degree. But then we have spikes that go beyond that. You don't want that. It's really likely not natural and not gonna happen without processed foods. So we have a few categories of things that can help here. Of course, we have foods that you could be eating during or after that processed food meal that could help you out, as well as potions that you can make. Yes, we will be going to potions class. And then there's also things like food timing and also moving your body. So we'll get to the research on that. And we'll start out with foods that you can eat. The first one is green leafies and vegetables. And I'm telling you, there's times where I've tried out a new vegan restaurant and it was literally an oil bomb. And I'm walking around looking at like wild edible plants. There are times where I literally ate some wild lamb's quarters and I feel like it made me feel better. Did it? Maybe, maybe not. Well, this study out of Japan gave people kale and measured their glycemic response in terms of postprandial or after meal glucose. And the baseline meal that they gave people was a meal that had white rice as well as chicken and other stuff. And the responses are, as you can see from this chart, the kale lowered the spikes and really lowered the area under the curve, which represents that sort of total amount of glucose difference. Here's another chart that really illustrates area under the curve well. And they did two different doses, seven grams or 14 grams of kale, and the 14 grams did better. But you might be thinking, hey, that's really not that much kale. In this case, it was just kale powder, and just a cup of cooked kale is like 115 grams, so not too much. If you are able to get your hands on some kale powder or kale like right before you eat or right as you are starting to eat, then that would probably help you out a bit. Now for the next one, this study looked at blood sugar spikes with romaine lettuce, watercress greens, or a placebo, which was straight up fiber, which I felt like maybe skewed the results. Like all of these are probably improving compared to a control group that they didn't have. And they ate this sort of standard American diet of white bread, hamburger, cheese, butter, mayonnaise, blah, blah, blah. And what do you think the results were? Do you think that, you know, romaine's perhaps just a cousin of that nutrient devoid iceberg lettuce probably didn't do much. Well, if you thought that, you're wrong because lettuce was the most effective here at lowering a postprandial blood glucose response. And we'll cover vegetables a bit more in a bit, but do you happen to have an apple on hand? Because if you do, eat it before your super junky meal that you have to eat in this circumstance. 
Um, yeah, from this study, that apple quite markedly reduces that blood sugar spike from this chart. And that brings me right along to berries with a study on people who have type two diabetes, which is of course gonna exaggerate the results a bit. And this is the case where over a few weeks they gave people red raspberries, but it shows that by eating those over time, you can get a resistance to whatever meal you're gonna eat. And so in this case, they saw about a 34% lowering in glucose response after that raspberry period, not bad. And get this, some inflammatory factors like interleukin-6 and TNF-alpha lowered by about half. And then we have another study that did just look at a single meal, and this is a situation where they gave people 35 grams of table sugar as a control or added berries on top of that. They gave people either black currant or lingonberry puree or juice. And the results were a little bit surprising for that. Well, first of all, while the purees didn't knock that spike down really much, they did prevent that crash later, which could really affect how you feel. But going to the juice results, weirdly the black currant juice was the most effective in blunting the spike. You would think the puree would have more fiber, etc. And again, we are concerned about the oxidative stress and potential damage of these meals. So getting your antioxidants status up is key and also along the lines of berries from this large meta-analysis of randomized control trials. Berries improved about one third of the oxidative stress markers and in certain cases showed decreases in DNA damage with like wild blueberry drinks. So in that sense, you can have the preventative angle of like, oh, I'm just gonna eat a lot of antioxidants in general and even especially that day, if I have to go out to like somebody's wedding or something and you know they're just gonna feed you like French fries. <laughs> All right, now it's time to get into these potions. And yeah, I guess you could say that kale powder one was a bit of a potion hack. You could just have that kale powder on hand. And the next one is another powder and that is Moringa leaf powder fancy new buzzword. This study, I wanted to include it anyway, but it's kind of small and they did it in like a refugee camp. I'm like, is that really the best place to be doing science? Well, hey, this is the dark arts anyway. <laughs> and yeah, they found that after a meal of rice and meat in normal and diabetic subjects, there was quite an improvement, notable improvement in that blood glucose response. And next up we have muggle leaf extract, sorry, I mean mulberry leaf extract in the study where they first gave people a mixed meal, which meant a lot of things like rice, tofu, onions, cheese, mushrooms, bacon, you know, cabbage, pork, et cetera, et cetera. There's a lot of stuff. And the cool thing they did here is they measured how that mulberry leaf extract worked in the morning versus the evening. And it is so clear that blood sugar spikes are gonna be bigger in the evening. However, the mulberry leaf extract helped lower those in both the morning and the evening, which is cool. Now for a quick break with our sponsor, Complement Essential, an awesome Compliment multivitamin essential. with, wait, what's happening? Is this Compliment being taken over essential. by some type Excuse of commercial? Me. Shut up. Complement Essential is a multi-nutrient that is loaded with things like vitamin B12, D, long chain omegas like DHA and EPA, zinc, iodine, selenium, and more. And most importantly, it is perfect for slapping ex-vegans with lame excuses in the face. My B12 level was low, emotionally, so I quit a vegan diet. What, no, I didn't get a blood test, whatever that is. After feeling tired once, I used Google to diagnose myself with hypothyroidism from low iodine, and then I quit my vegan diet. I felt like I didn't have enough, like, ocean in my body. Metaphysically, later my boyfriend said it was probably an omega-3 deficiency from not enough fish, and that's why I quit my vegan diet. Ah! Don't be a stupid ex-vegan. Compliment yourself. Compliment and Mike the Vegan do not encourage slapping and are not responsible for slap-related injuries. Use code MIKE15 to get 15% off Compliment Essential, Mike's favorite multivitamin for plant-based and plant-centric eaters. But now I can be vegan again thanks to Compliment. And now for another type of sort of potion adding, just, just vinegar. You know I have an entire video on this and how incredible vinegar is at blunting blood sugar spikes, but you can just keep a little tincture, a little flask, just in the restaurant, just pouring a little flask in your food. Yeah, they're probably gonna kick you out for that, actually. Just gonna pull this tincture out of my wizarding robe. Anyway, yeah, from this uh, massive review, there's a ton of different ways in which vinegar helps from this chart. You know, it even helps with glucose transportation of the muscle on and on. And there's another type of magical brew that you can just grind up these leaves of various plants and then you put stew this warm water. It's tea, I'm talking about tea. Uh, right off the bat, we've got 
cinnamon tea, which appears to help from this study. They gave people 75 grams of glucose, had a control or not, and the cinnamon helped with the spike. However, other studies where the concentration wasn't as high, it didn't work, so you might need like five or six grams in your tea. The classic black tea appears to work in blunting blood sugar spikes. However, multiple studies on green tea have not shown a difference, but credit where credit is due from this massive meta-analysis, green tea appears to lower fasting blood glucose, so can't forget about that. And what about the famous hibiscus tea and all of its antioxidants? Yes, this study which gave 25 grams of table sugar and 25 grams of bread found that Yes, it blunted blood sugar spikes from that, which is awesome. And they did multiple doses. The higher tea dose shaved like a third off of the peak. So yeah, hibiscus for the win. Just remember it's acidic, so use a straw. And a lot of these studies are pointing to the polyphenol or antioxidant benefit, like as the cinnamon study mentions. Polyphenols can even modulate insulin in a beneficial way. So yay for antioxidants. And so again, even if you're not making a huge difference in that peak, you could be cutting the damage that that blood glucose peak is doing with antioxidants. And speaking of oxidative stress, walnuts from this study have been shown to lower postprandial oxidative stress by a little bit, still worth including. Which brings us just to nuts. Multiple nuts have also directly been shown to lower blood sugar response. From the study again, yeah, almonds do it as well. They made quite a big difference in that one. And from this study, they gave bread or bread and nuts or bread and olive oil and nuts in the form of walnuts had the lowest blood sugar spike as you can see by the chart of bread plus nuts. Now, maybe you're just panic watching this video as you just had three milkshakes and four servings of fries and thinking, I don't have any berries or nuts or greens on me. What else can I do? Uh, well, you can also move your body. Even in the form of fast walking, just don't spill your green tea because this study looked at green tea and fast walking or a combination of both. Here's the chart with sitting at the highest as a control. Green tea only was slightly better, basically meaningless. And green tea plus fast walking did the best, cutting that hump down quite a bit, making you wonder, was it just the fast walking? The other green tea studies didn't show anything. It's probably the walking. Well, this meta-analysis on these postprandial glucose spikes has a few takeaways. One being that exercise such as 20 minutes of walking has an acute beneficial impact on postprandial high blood sugar, especially if it's soon after a meal. They have other takeaways of you can't wait too long, otherwise the effect won't work. You can't do the exercise before you eat, otherwise it won't work. But they say that, hey, this could lower disease risk, whether it's inflammatory disease or heart disease. And yeah, this is likely as simple as your body eating up that extra blood glucose with your muscles moving. It's obvious, let's move on. Next we have food order, the order in which you eat food, in case you're wondering. I have a whole video on this, but it seems that carbs last is pretty much always the answer. Multiple studies have shown this, whether you're eating fat or protein before carbs, it's gonna be better. Also, we have studies showing that eating vegetables before carbs is hugely beneficial. From the study on healthy young women, regardless of how fast you eat, we see a huge beneficial drop in eating vegetables before carbs. And from this study, feeding people a typical Western meal, which you know isn't good, People with type two diabetes showed a staggering difference in their glucose and that area under the curve was like 80% lower. And this is the most dramatic of like any effect I've seen. All right, now we can move on to blood fat spikes after a meal. Many of you OG viewers know this as sludge blood that I've referred to it in the past. And I will say a lot of people who are so paranoid and afraid of getting their blood sugar up at all and going low carb are just not doing any measurements of these postprandial hyperlipidemia episodes where you can just have fat go up and peak at four hours all the way to eight hours, and that has a massive risk. Well, of this, not fully his fault, Justin of Stop Spiking Blood Sugar on TikTok does a video showing, oh, bacon doesn't spike your blood sugar. He warns lightly about it, but the comment section is clearly just a celebration. <laughs> and in terms of those fat spikes, Back to this study, it causes oxidative stress and inflammation and has adverse effects and independently potentiates the adverse effects of that high blood sugar. And from this other study, postprandial hyperlipidemia has various atherogenic or artery clogging properties such as, again, inflammation and endothelial dysfunction, which is artery wall dysfunction. 
You can also see things like lowered oxygen, actually the charge of your blood cells changing, so they end up stacking like quarters, which is not good. You know, the literal milkiness or lactescence of your blood can go up, and that's what can lead to angina in heart patients, and all of this sort of heavy meal effect is what leads to people having an increased heart attack after eating those types of meals from a study like this one that I covered in my intermittent fasting video recently, which you should check out. And in the case of fatty blood or lipemia after a meal, the main measurement here is triglycerides in the blood. All right, so what do we got here? How about greens? Well, from this lettuce and watercress study, we're seeing a slight improvement there with the watercress after a high fat meal, but it wasn't statistically significant. Wah, wah. But back to potion, spirulina, another green powder out there from this study did appear to lower that postprandial lipemia after a high fat meal in young athletes. And then of course it always just comes back to berries. More berries. This randomized crossover trial in overweight individuals with high cholesterol gave them a high fat meal with fat from dairy, eggs, and margarine. And then they gave them either a placebo or strawberries in the form of 10 grams of freeze dried strawberries. Why not? Did it work? Oh uh, yeah, they found that strawberries lowered their after meal blood fat in the form of triglycerides and it also lowered their oxidized LDL or bad cholesterol, which is awesome. So in this case, in your wizarding cloak, you can just carry around a, a packet of freeze-dried berry dust just sprinkle it. And I really wish we had more studies on postprandial lipemia. They're kind of hard to come by, but we do have a ton on, again, moving your body. We have this massive review on the topic and the results are looking quite nice. And they had so many studies, they went as far as to compare the bang for your buck for doing aerobic exercise after eating or doing some strength training, lifting weights. And they say that because of the extra effort required in the aerobic stuff to get results, that strength training could be the most efficient way. But how much is this blunting that lipemia? Well, here's an example of one of those studies that looked at a control or aerobic or strength training. And the triglyceride drop after a meal was huge. And again, because so much effort was expelled in the cardio group, the previous researchers were like, just lift weights. However, I feel like if you like cardio, that's a win for you, do that. So after you've just downed two Impossible Burgers at Burger King, what you do is you just sprint down the street. That's gonna, it's either gonna come up and you're not gonna get the blood spike or it's gonna, you get what I'm saying. And really quick, what about sodium? What maybe sodium spikes could be happening leading to high blood pressure? Is this a concern? Well, we do have experts from articles like this saying that your blood pressure may increase with within 30 minutes of consuming excess salt. However, looking around at the research, I didn't really see a consistent picture here. Sometimes it was slightly going up, sometimes it was staying the same. And then the main concern really seems to be actually crashing blood sugar, especially in the elderly with this study calling it like a silent killer. And that appears to be because so much blood is going to the digestive system and the heart can't keep up, et cetera. But if you are somebody who has like verified high blood pressure after eating, let's like say restaurant meals or whatever, one hack could be, could be getting more nitrates, having beet juice like an hour or so before you eat, perhaps dilating those arteries, increasing blood volume, and then lowering blood pressure. But there's like no signs behind that, just speculation, do your own stuff. But perhaps the biggest point here is back to this study on this whole topic, quote, specifically a diet high in minimally processed, high fiber plant-based foods, such as vegetables and fruits, whole grains, legumes, and nuts will markedly blunt the post-meal increase in glucose, triglycerides, and inflammation. Ugh. So again, that's the goal of how you actually wanna eat in my book, more whole foods, the better. But it's also like you live in the real world. If you wanna be traveling, you wanna be celebrating things, you wanna be trying new things. Uh, I don't know, it could be practical info. I know I'm gonna be using more of these. And again, it's not just about focusing on the spike and getting the spike down, which is usually good. It's also about fighting any oxidative stress from any source, which could also be preservatives and things and different chemicals and food that we didn't talk about. And how, of course, antioxidants are gonna help you with that. Another reason that the carnivore diet sucks because it has essentially zero antioxidants. And I'm sure I missed some cool hacks for blunting these negative effects. Share them down below in the comments if you think of any. And of course, if you would like to compliment yourself, you can use code MIKE15 for 15% off Compliment Essential with the link below. And of course, feel free to like, subscribe, all that good stuff, and I'll see you in the next one. Thanks for watching.